five minutes on the hash stretch. No worries. Right, good morning, everyone. As it said, I am Les Pounder, but who am I? You know my name, but you don't really know who I am. So I'm known as Big Les P on Twitter, or as Nicholas Tolovey calls me, Biggles. <laughs> don't know why. Um, I'm a creative technologist, which means I get to play with stuff and people pay me, which is great. I love it. I get to go to pound shops and hack stuff. I get to go to offices like Google's office and Cisco, and they say, here's some toys to play with. Oh, thank you very much. But that's not all what I do. I also write for magazines. So you can see on the right-hand side, I write for these magazines. I do tutorials. But it's not tutorials for the ultra, I know everything about Python, I know everything about C++. It's the people who are just starting out, the children, the young adults who've never done any coding whatsoever. And that's what I like to do. I like to write things that people can start with. It's not ultra hard Python something that they can get their teeth into and become interested in. And a while ago, I used to be part of the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Pi Academy team. So I used to go around the country helping people to make robots using about 14 lines of Python code, which was really bad because I wrote it in 2014 and I didn't know what I was doing. To be fair, it's 2018, I've still no idea. Pause for laugh. Okay. Go on, I know it's the early morning. So why am I here? In 2013, I went a bit mad. I got made redundant as a project manager for a digital agency in Manchester. And I thought, what am I going to do? Do I go and sign on the dole? For anyone who's not from the UK, the dole is where well, you get money for being unemployed. Well, no, I've done that in the past. I don't want to do it again. It's not my life. So I decided to become a freelancer. So at 12 o'clock, when I got made redundant, I left the office. I got on a train home, because yes, they made me travel into the office for an hour to tell me I was made redundant. <sighs> Yay. And I went home, contacted a few people, said, right, can I write for you? And will you pay me? Yeah. But it wasn't all brilliant straight away. There was a famine before the feast, as they say. The first month, I had no clients. I had no work. Just one column in a magazine, which doesn't pay a lot of money. So I had to think on my feet. And this is where something fortuitous happened. I became a faker. So on June 11th, 2013, I've checked the emails to know the date of this. I got an email from Ben Nuttall. You all know Ben, don't you? Saw him yesterday get his award. He's a clever lad. He's talking this afternoon, is he? Just, I just after lunch, come and see him. So I got an email from Ben, and it said, uh, I've been offered this gig teaching Python. Uh, I can't do it, but I've taken a job at Raspberry Pi Foundation. Would you like to do it? I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, put me in contact. We'll, we'll see what happens. But as you probably read from the bottom bit of the slide, I didn't know any Raspberry Pi. I didn't know any electronics. I didn't know any Python. And on Monday, that Monday, I was expected to go on stage and do all of that. So I said to the client, yes, I can do that. And if the clients are watching the video, I don't do that anymore. OK? No. So I had to learn Python really fast. Anyone under 18, do not do this. <laughs> All right? Half a bottle of Sailor Jerry, uh, a Python book, uh, Python for Rookies, I believe it was, that I got. There might be someone in the room who's used that. I don't know. I think I see him at the back. That got me on the way, and I crammed as much Python knowledge into my brain as I could, and how to light up an LED, and obviously XKCD cartoon there to illustrate the, uh, the Barmer Peak, where the amount of blood alcohol you have can make you a super good coder. Don't do this at work, please. Don't go in for hip flask going, hang on boss, I'll get it done by the afternoon. Let's go. Don't. So I had to learn really fast, and somehow I made it. On the Monday, I got up in front of about 30 teachers, and I got through it. I was happy as Larry, whoever Larry is. But there were a few issues. I made a couple of cock-ups. Um, missed some slides. Wired up an LED wrong. Not an issue. Just turn it around. It's a polarized component. I know now, but in 2013, I didn't. Uh, and I may have took down the network that we use for the Raspberry Pis. Oops. 
But, you know, it's a fail. Now, has anyone heard of fail before? Yeah? We'll get some nods. And we'll, get, we'll do left side of the room versus right, yes. Yeah. So, first attempt in learning, or further if you're really bad at it, like me. You will fail, you will have a massive problem, you will find this issue that crops up, like this morning, I'm having to do this talk with no speaker notes. Because Windows, which worked this morning, about an hour ago, fine, plugged it into here, it was like, no, I'm sorry, Les, I'm not going to do any speaker notes for you today. Yay. But that's it, I just get on with it, and I can talk the ears of a donkey, sorry. But the fail mantra that I follow is something that these two people on the screen follow. Do you know who they are? Who's going to shout the names out? Ten points, Gryffindor. Yep. Sorry? Ravenclaw. Apologies. I will. It's Simone Yurtz and Adam Savage. They are my heroes. They are fantastic. They will make fantastic contraptions. They will make mistakes. Simone Yurtz, and this is a code of conduct thing, I have to be very careful how I say this, is the queen of poopy robots, okay? She makes really stupid contraptions, but it doesn't matter because they're fun. They illustrate something that could be made. They get kids excited, they get adults excited. I'm excited and I think, I think I'm an adult, I don't know. Adam Savage used to work for LucasArts, so Lucasfilm, making props and models for Star Wars films and now he has Mythbusters, we all know him from that. He makes mistakes on there. So hopefully not with TNT or C4, so he doesn't lose a finger, but you know. So this fail mantra, and my starting out learning Python and electronics and Raspberry Pi, it sort of changed my mind a little bit. Before, I was never a programmer, so I was 35 when I started programming. And you can work out the math world I am now, all right? But Python was the first language that made sense. Before that, I had an Arduino. And I have lots of love for Arduino, but by heck, can I not understand that interface sometimes? It's confusing. But when I first started out, I needed help. Now, we all know the internet is full of unicorns and rainbows and fluffy kittens and all that, and it's wonderful, isn't it? No one's ever going to say, get off this forum noob or anything like that. Correct? No, I'm right. So I was scared to ask that first question, just like I'm scared right now talking in front of you all. You know, the pulse is a bit up and a bit flushed. Thank you, Mum. So that first question you ever ask is the scariest one because you're setting a precedent. You're thinking, how am I going to phrase this without sounding like a complete idiot? Well, just ask the question. Just be clear and succinct and just ask the question. People will, if you're in the right community, like the Python community, will help you. The Raspberry Pi community, they'll help you. But asking that first question, that fear, made me more empathic. That's why Councillor Troy's on the screen, in case anyone's wondering, from Star Trek, in case anyone's so young that remember the next generation. She's an empath, she understands how people feel. And now I use that whenever I write some documentation. I'm empathic to how that person is when they read it. So little Jimmy in Tyne and Weir, who's taking his first steps with Raspberry Pi and making an LED light up, I will write the instructions to help him understand it. But it'll also apply to Jane, who's 35 and she lives in Scotland. I write it so that they can have the same journey that I had and understand that it's okay to fail, it's okay to have a mistake, just don't worry. So, we move on. PyCon UK, 2013 in Coventry. My very first PyCon. And I can see my friend there, Lord Morven, the audience, he was there as well, with his fez on. We had an education summit there, and we had two days, one day for teachers, one day for kids. It was mental. We had kids hacking Minecraft. We had drones being controlled by Minecraft on a Raspberry Pi. How? I've got no idea. I just know they didn't program it, so when it flies up, they didn't program the thing that says, bring it down. <laughs> had to wait for the batteries. <laughs> yeah. But I was there helping people to learn Python, these teachers. And I'm like, hang on, I've only been doing this six months. I've got no clue what's going on with Python. Don't worry about it. Tag along, have a play, see what happens. Okay. So over that weekend, I helped teachers to take the first steps with Python and Minecraft. I worked with kids who had some crazy ideas on what they wanted to do, which is brilliant. 
And yeah, I had great fun. And then on from that, I did Pi Academy, as I said before. So from 2014 to last year, I've done 26 roughly Pi Academies, I lost count. So that's 780 teachers, so roughly, across the UK that I've taught. And I've used the same 14 lines of really bad Python that I wrote in 2014 to teach them how to make a motor spin for a random amount of time. That's it. So an Explorer hat's an add-on board for Raspberry Pi. It's got a button, you press it. Yeah, random, how many seconds? Eh, five. Spin, 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 stop, that's it. But I've now seen from that 14 lines of code about 400 different projects spring up from that really bad code. Um, I also led the very first Pi Academy at Google and Leeds. I was the first person not from the Raspberry Pi Foundation to have their own training center. Yay. And I loved it. So am I a make yet? Sorry about the creepy fortune teller, all right? Sorry. If anyone's scared of fortune tellers, I apologize. So I was doing more Python. This is 2014 still. And a client came up to me and said, uh, hi, Les, you, you work Raspberry Pi in Blackpool, don't you? Uh, you do stuff for kids and all that. We've got a problem. We've got this fortune teller that we want to build. And can you help us? Here's the faking part coming back again. Yeah, no worries, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. If they're watching, I did know what I was doing. I'm looking at the camera. So we spent about four weeks building this fortune teller from a Raspberry Pi Model B, a Pi face walk, which was a couple of relays, to interface with 12 volt arcade electronics. And I'm, here's a confession for you. This is where I made my biggest fail ever. You ever seen the, the little black chip on a Raspberry Pi, the brain, yeah? Ever seen it melt? <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah, five amps is not good for it. I accidentally attached it to the bench power supply. It wasn't at point, was it five milliamps? No, it was at five amps. Oopsie. Oh well, I learned. I learned not to use a bench power supply. Um, so this entire, I don't know why I'm pointing it, it's over here. This entire fortune teller is powered by Python. There's about 40 lines of code, and it really is just plain random MP3 files. You put your 50p in, and it triggers a series of pulses on the coin mech, which is the bottom right image. The pulses go to relays, and it clicks the relays on and off, which then turns a GPIO pin on, and it chooses a random bit of audio. So it'll either say, you are going to walk down the street and get hit by a car, or well, probably not that in the car, um, Something nice, you know, you're going to go meet a tall, dark, handsome stranger, or you're going to get a lottery win later today. And it spits out all this wonderful stuff. And that was the first project. That was made for Blackpool Tower. So at the base of Blackpool Tower is a fortune teller scaring the hell out of kids. Because it speaks to you when you walk past. Come and play this game, it will say. You're like, oh dear, don't like this. It's also used for the Formula One commentary on the steeplechase ride, a little go-kart things. Random fact there. So what did learning Python teach me? Well, it taught me to think like a coder. Before, I, was, I wasn't a coder. I didn't have the logical thought train to think, OK, I need a loop to do this. I need to check if this button's been pressed, etc., etc. the stuff we take for granted. But it's also helped me to think that Python and coding in general can be used as a tool for social change. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got a YouTube video. I'm going to play it, and you can hear my voice from 2015. It's the same as now, but yeah, sorry. And this is an interface I made for my wife's aunt. And you're going to think, why is that so special? Well, three years ago, she had a stroke. She cannot speak. She cannot move her arms, anything. Well, she can move one arm. That's it. Apologies. She can't communicate. So this is an MIT App Inventor app that I made that kids can make in school. It's so simple, and I'm not belittling it. It is so simple to make. That any kid can make this soundboard with Arnie phrases, with film phrases, whatever you want. But I used it so my auntie could say, I need a drink, or I need to go to the bathroom. So I'm going to play the audio. And now it skips a slide. Well done. Here we go.
Hi everyone, quick video. Hi everyone. As you know, my auntie's currently in a care home after having a stroke earlier on this year, and she has trouble communicating. All the basics we take for granted, she's unable to do. So, using MIT App Inventor and following their course online today, in about an hour and a half, I made a very simple soundboard, which hopefully is going to help her to communicate to us. So, the basics are there, well, I'll show you around. So, if we ask her a question, she can say yes or no. Yes. No. The voice has got she better She can say sense. hello to us. Hello. And obviously there's bits and pieces there for all the ways of communicating. So, if I'm hungry. I am hungry. Again, I'm thirsty. I am thirsty. And then obviously, to send us home. Please go home. If they get sick and tired of our conversation. So and then the some serious right ones, obviously colour-coded in red. So if there is pain. And if we need to get a nurse, she can tell us. I need a nurse. Anyway, still playing around. So that's the gist of it. So that enables her to communicate. And we've tested it. My auntie is in her mid-70s. Technology to her is remote control. That's it. If she can put ITV4 on for some Catherine Cookson, she's happy. So this is a, a Nexus 7 tablet I got from eBay for about 30 quid. Nothing. So I'm also doing more bits and pieces with artists. So this is social change again. So I'm working with an artist in Blackpool with micro bits and Raspberry Pis and bare conductive touch boards to effect social change. So we have an installation coming up probably next year for homeless. So in Blackpool, where I'm from, massive number of homeless people. Cardiff has a massive number of homeless people. I come from the hotel to here, I'm seeing a dozen at least. So, homeless people, do we ever stand and talk to them? Do we? Yeah? Do you stand and talk to them? You're not at their level, are you? The homeless person's on the ground. If you're towering above them, it's going to go slightly off mic, excuse me, ladies. How does that make you feel? If you're that homeless person on the ground and you're talking down to them, it's almost as if you're saying, I don't really want to talk to you. We mean well by doing it. I've done it. But the art installation we're working on has voice recordings of interviews with homeless people and using bare conductive touch boards and conductive paint, we're creating a mock-up of a homeless person, a mannequin of sorts, and to actually interact with the art piece, you have to go down to their level so to speak, and actually interact and talk with them. So you have to go down and say, and touch. And that's hopefully going to cause a few questions and a few conversations to be raised. Hopefully. It might not, but at least we tried. So there's a little tagline slide there. Why do I use Python? Well, it's versatile. It's the second best language for anything. Dan Callahan from Mozilla at PyCon this year, he said that. Quite brave in front of 4,000 people, you know. But Python's becoming the norm for children. If we go into school now, we'll see kids using Python. And Scratch, obviously. But kids are also helping kids. So did anyone see Joshua Lowe, his EduBlocks project? Yeah? If you haven't, Google it, EduBlocks. These slides will be released after this talk as well, so you can go straight to there. They're in speaker notes that I can't see. I know. Kids are helping kids. So Josh was helping kids to learn Python by creating a block language that translates blocks into Python. We have Fimo, who was on yesterday, Hacker Fimo, who was a uh, Femi, I should call him, sorry. Uh, he was doing um, projects with Minecraft with kids, with Microbit. He's helping children to learn. When we were 14, what were we doing? I know what I was doing, it involved a park and cider, but, you know. But these kids who have got technology in their hands, especially in 2012, they're the ones who are now going to university. They're the ones that are taking a career in technology now. And they're the ones that are gonna shape our future and probably steal our jobs. So I'm a maker, allegedly. 
Um, is Python for makers? Yes. And on the right-hand side are some boards and bits and pieces from my desk of stuff that use Python. Uh, so top left, we've got an Adafruit Circuit Playground Express. We've got Onion Omega 2. We've got a Gemma M0. We've got a Microbits. We've got Raspberry Pi, obviously. Uh, we've got a Bolt. And we've got a Pocket Chip and an ESP32. And at the bottom, you're going to see something really weird, like a bread bin. It's a laser cutter. The laser cutter runs Python. It's called K40 Whisperer, the software. It's great, and you can hack it to do whatever you want. I have. So um, I've only got five minutes. I'm going to try and speed through this bit. Right. Don't worry. So this is something I like to do, mixing Python libraries. Have you ever worked with any children, any adults, who just sat there thinking, what, what do I do with Python? What? I can make Hello World appear on the screen really, really loads of times, but I'm bored of that. What can I do? Well, this is self-promotion now, sorry. But I do a, a, a blog, and on Tuesdays, every so often, I'll do Tuesday tooling, where I talk about a different project or a different Python library or a different tool I found on eBay for cheap. And I like doing mashups. So GPIO Zero, you've all heard of that, Ben Nuttall's project for Raspberry Pi, plus the web browser library, which is built in plus mouse, which is a way of controlling the mouse with Python. I can make an assistive push button or a sensor interface a specialist needs. Three libraries and probably about 15 lines of code. So I can have someone with a big red button. If they want to go onto Google, hit the red button. I could have a sensor where they wave their hand in front of it. They can do whatever they want. Um, Microbit dongle and Minecraft. In fact, this is what Femi was doing the other day. A microbit interface for Python to control Minecraft. Uh, and the last one, GeoPy, to work out your location via a postcode or longitude, latitude. Pi pollen, so you can see pollen counts. And NeoPixels, because everyone loves shiny lights, don't they? Yeah. You can show the pollen count. So if it's green, you can go outside. If it's red, wear a hazmat suit. Oh. So nearly at the end, don't worry. Don't need to fall asleep. So how can you help? I'd like you to help. So I want you to inspire people around you. I'm not talking about going into the office every day saying, hey, everyone, let's go for a 10-mile hike, and then let's write some code. Just help them. If they've got a problem, help them. If they need a bit of support, if they can't do something, help. Become a STEM ambassador. I'm a STEM ambassador. I go into schools across the Northwest, where I'm from, and I'll help kids. I don't get paid for that. I just go because I like doing it. I help the kids build robots. I help the kids hack together some weird contraptions. It's great fun. You could start a club, a Raspberry Jam. You've heard of Raspberry Jams? Yeah? I won't do the joke where I say, oh, no, it's not stuff you put on toast. Yeah. Uh, Python user groups, code clubs, code dojos, volunteer. You don't have to start one. Just go and volunteer. If you become a STEM ambassador, you get a DBS check so you can work with children. You get insurance so you can work with children. Not that children are dangerous. They're not going to attack you or anything. Well, some. So, near at the end, two slides. A call to arms. After this talk, go and help someone. Anyone. If it's someone out there who just needs a hand carrying a cup of tea, go for it. If it's someone who's got a problem with Python, help them. If it's a language that you know nothing about and they have a problem, help them solve the issue. It could just be logic. We don't know. Don't tell them the answer. Just help them discover the answer. If they can discover it for themselves, it's ultimately rewarding, but also be empathic. If you can write documentation, do so, but be empathic as to who the users are who are going to be using it. But just remember that people haven't got your skill. And that is the end of the slide, and that QR code I made last night in the hotel room using Python, and that's me in Cardiff's Poundland with some really naff glasses on. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Liz, for that very nice talk, very entertaining talk. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions now. We've just run to the hard stop. Um, so there's a couple of minutes um, when you've got time to move to the next room. But if you want to ask Liz a question, uh, I'm sure we could answer it on the edge of the